lived in Denver very long when Dylan was born. He was precious. He was just so precious. I miss him. I miss him a lot. I remember being in the hospital. I was holding him and I got this strange feeling. And the only thing I could describe it as was a feeling of like a shadow went over me. It just was this strange feeling like something was passing over me. And at that moment, I had a sense that the child I was holding, there was either something wrong with him or that he would bring me sorrow. Very soon after that, Dylan became sick. He had uh, a health issue, pyloric stenosis. And I remember thinking when that happened that I must have been sensing that he had a health problem. After he died, I woke up remembering that day of how this child was going to bring me sorrow. We all got under the desk and, and then they just started coming in the library and opening fire and shooting out bombs. bombs. So many people. dressed in long black trench coats opened fire uh, about an hour and a half ago at a high school just outside of Denver in Littleton, Colorado. Uh, at least three students have been injured and possibly as many as eight. We know that victims have been taken to area hospitals. One student has apparently been critically injured and we know that one of the victims may be an adult woman. Uh, there is a huge press of I was getting ready for a meeting. Uh, I had to go from our downtown office to one of the colleges. And I was getting ready to go, and I got back to my desk, and I saw the message light flashing on my phone. listen to the television and he put the phone apparently by the TV and I thought what the heck is on television something like that we're still getting information in constantly and I just said I'm coming home I'm coming home right now and I could tell from the tone of his voice that something had happened to one of our kids
And this is a journal that Dylan gave me. And it's um, a strange irony that it's Edvard Munch's The Scream. But he knew I loved art, and he saw this book, and he got it for me. And this is uh, April 21st, 1999. Yesterday, my life entered the most abhorrent nightmare anyone could imagine. I can't even write about it. And then three days later was the next thing I wrote. That we talked to on the telephone describe them as members of the trench coat mafia. These are kids they claim routinely dress in black trench coats and uh, have issued threats before to seek revenge on any other students that may have made fun of them along the way. Now, there was an exchange of gunfire a little over 25 minutes ago from the inside out. Believe that some 1,800 students attend that school right now. The deputy sheriffs are saying that they believe uh, there is a good possibility that hostages are trapped inside police are Seriously looking at a theory right now that the suspects may actually be students of the school. Sir, we're with the police department. Are you Tom Klebold? Yes. Yeah. In the middle of an active investigation. Mrs. Klebold, I need you to both exit the house immediately. I was in a major panic. I was in total disbelief that Dylan could do such a horrible thing. I was numb. Tears came intermittently, but I was mostly in shock. During the siege, as we learned of more and more deaths, I prayed that Dylan would die. I wanted someone to stop him before anyone else was hurt. I knew if he were brought out alive, I could not face the years of imprisonment and possibly execution. I prayed that God would take one of my two precious boys and end his life as quickly as possible. So, yeah. That morning, I heard him bounding down the stairs heavily, like he was in a hurry. And I ran to my bedroom door. I could hear him go past my door. I opened the door. I said, Dill? And at that point, he had gotten to the front door. When he sort of slammed the door and said goodbye, I had no idea that I had just heard his voice for the last time. I thought, something is bothering him, whatever it is. I had no concept of the magnitude of what was about to happen. Jefferson County 911. Yes, I am a teacher called by high school. There is a student here with a gun. He was shot out a window. Um, okay, has anybody been injured, ma'am? Yes. Okay. Yes. And the school is in a panic, and I'm in the library. I've got students down out of the table, kids. Heads under the table. So the binders are where I keep uh, important articles, documents, court records, journals, everything related to a particular shooter. And for some shooters, there's a massive binder, even two binders. Others have multiple shooters within one if there's not a lot of information on them. Nine of these are relating to Columbine. You know, at the time that Columbine happened, I was working in a psychiatric facility, a hospital for children and adolescents. Columbine was April 20th, 1999. April 30th, just 10 days later, a 16-year-old boy was admitted to the hospital because he was seen as a Columbine-type risk. And I was assigned the case to evaluate him. And not long after that, there was another one and then another one. And I saw a steady trickle of potential school shooters coming through the hospital, and that's how I got into doing this research. Dylan was one of the most challenging shooters I've studied to try to understand. Well, there were people who spoke about Dylan as like the sweetest, cutest little boy you could ever meet. And one of his own friends described him as the least violent person I ever knew. 
they, they actually were really, really nice people who just liked having a good time. I really got to know the guys. Uh, they were pretty, pretty nice people. Guys, they gave us the image of being full of cotton fuzz. I mean, they were the sweetest guys on the face of the earth. So the enigma was how does someone go from being the least violent person to committing mass murder? Yeah, the first thing you want to know is where were the parents? What were the parents doing? How did they try to prevent this? How could a kid possibly be making a bomb in the garage and you don't know? How could they have access to that many guns and you didn't notice? They're in the garage making these things. Where the hell were their parents? How do you have a 15-year-old son in your basement making bombs dressed in black trench coats part of this subculture and not know it if you, you want to be able to say yes it was your fault if only you had punished them that day not punished them that day had this philosophy of, of television and the internet or had that philosophy of television and the internet So if no one ever again does what you did, then it will never happen again, and that will make me safe. That will make my children safe. We need to blame. Blame makes things logical. And I finally turned to somebody and said, is my son dead? And he said, yes. And I said, can you tell me how he died? And he said, no, I can't. And I don't know if he didn't know or if he wasn't allowed to tell me. But that sort of finally was confirmation that Dylan was gone. You know, it would take years for me to put all this together to understand really what happened. I didn't even get a police report until six months after to know what had happened. Up until that point, all the things I was reading in the paper, there was so much that was false. I was clinging to the fact that maybe they were wrong about Dylan being there. I was really very much in denial. So it began a long, long journey for me to one layer at a time to try to accept what had happened, have that knowledge and still go on living and um, loving. And it just took a lot of work and a lot of time. I started writing about this because I thought, we all thought, that when you look back, when you really dig in, when you go through life in those houses that these kids grew up in, you'll find something. You'll find warning signs. People blamed the Harrises and the Klebolds because everyone believes that you have to recognize a monster when it lives with you. I think one of the things we may have learned in the 20 years since then is that that's not true. One of the hardest things I still do is uh, visit the memorials.
It's hard enough to cope with the loss of your own child, but when you think of your own child doing this much harm, it's almost too much to bear sometimes. children and this teacher they didn't die they were killed by my son and his friend and that's that's the horrible hard part to live with there was always this sense of my own failure you know I was thinking I didn't listen well enough I didn't teach but Dylan was taught right and wrong in every conceivable way and Dylan was the kind of person who helped his friends. You know, he'd stop and run and go get a can of gas for a stranger. He was a nice person. We never had a bad teacher conference. Uh, he was always a good student and had friends and interests. And, you know, he was just, a, he was a pleasure. He was a joy. And a child like that makes you feel like a fabulous parent. I mean, I thought I was just the greatest thing because look at this kid does everything right. Yeah. It's nice to remember him as a happy child. He was such a busy, productive child. He wasn't a kind of a kid that would sit around and waste time and say, I'm bored. He was always doing something. He always was building something. He started doing origami in third grade. You know, as fast as he could, he would make these little origami figures and they would be wrinkled and crooked, but he would have memorized, you know, 60, 70 folds and he'd remember how to do them and could do them without the book nearby. And I thought it was pretty remarkable. As usual, I was incredibly proud of everything he did. This was us going on a train at Georgetown. And it's just Dylan and me sitting together. And of course, I'm looking at him because I always was. I thought he was so adorable and he was having a good time. And this is a cute picture of Dylan. He was at a, his brother's birthday party. And you, know, you could just see what a normal, goofy kid he was. He was yucking it up with the kids. And here he is as a teenager. He was 15 in this picture, playing cards with the family. And that was before he let his hair grow long. He was actually quite handsome with short hair. I wish he'd kept it short. Normal family stuff. And this was the last picture that was taken of our family, taken a few weeks before he died. We were at a restaurant. It's amazing how much people got wrong about Columbine. The first take on a shooting is almost never completely right. And in this case, the things we thought we knew had pretty much nothing to do with why these kids went and shot up the school. Students say they were members of a small group of outcasts known as the Trench Coat Mafia. So-called Trench Coat Mafia. And trench Coat Mafia. They practice satanic rituals. Witnesses say the gunmen went after classmates who had made fun of them in the past. 
And in this case, we see kids who don't have strong social ties. These gunmen were going into this school to single out uh, individuals. The gunmen were described as gothic freaks. With police saying the boys may have been part of a dark underground national phenomenon known as the gothic movement. The first assumption was, you know, goth, and and that led to, and how could their parents not have noticed, because all these things that, that everyone thought was happening to them and led to the shooting were things that should have been visual and obvious, and so how could the parents not have known? Parents started suing each other, the parents of the victims in places like Columbine and Paducah and, and Jonesboro all started bringing lawsuits against the parents of the shooters. Michael Carneal was accused of shooting up Paducah High School, and his parents and he both walked lawyers through almost every minute of every day before the shooting. and. It was so banal. It was so mundane. You saw what the parents saw, and they thought they were having Thanksgiving. And then you saw it from Michael's point of view. And when the parents thought he was off riding his bike around the neighborhood, he was off stealing guns and hiding them. But there was nothing that a parent would have seen or might have done. And that was terrifying. If it were something you could identify about bad parenting, then yes, suing the parents and holding them responsible would keep other parents from doing it. But there wasn't anything that you could hold parents accountable for and make sure that no other parent ever did it. Yes, there are always questions for the parents, but sometimes there are also answers. And as a society, we, we can't handle them. We don't want to hear them. We don't want to hear that, yes, your kid it actually can make a bomb in the garage and you might not notice. We don't want that to be true. You can be the best parent and your kid can still go off the rails. Your kid can do terrible things and you can't always predict them or prevent them. And that is a really, really scary thing as a parent that you can do the best you can and it can still go so completely wrong. Dylan had a cluster of trouble in his junior year. There was some vandalism at school. He scratched a locker. Now, years later, I read that he had written a swear word. I didn't know that at the time. We thought it was just a scratch. Another thing that occurred at about the same time was he and his friends hacked into the computer school system and figured out how to get to the locker combinations. 
And then at about that same time, he and Eric, his friend, ended up stealing some equipment from a van that was parked on a country road down near where our house was. All those things happened in a cluster. And I was trying to keep the ship steered, and figure out what was going wrong. I remember talking with other friends, family members, parents, and they said, oh, you should have seen the stuff I did when I was in high school, and Dylan's a good kid, he would never do anything wrong. And we talked about it, and at the time, I said, Dylan, I'm worried, I don't know what this means, I think maybe you need to see a counselor. He said, I don't want to go to a counselor, and I will prove to you that I'm okay. And I said, well, okay, you know, you proved to me, that sounds good, and he did. He didn't get in trouble anymore for the remaining 14 months of his life. You know, people would say, how could you not know? How could you not see this? The behavior that I saw three days before his death was him going to a prom, you know, six couples in a limousine, going out to dinner, dancing, coming home and telling me he'd had the best time of his life, thanking me for making it possible. That was what I saw. And when he did what he did, you know, everyone had the expectation that that he would have been showing these behaviors to us as parents, but he wasn't. And I don't think there are people to this day who still really accept that. Sue Klebold's experience with her son, if there were signs there and we could say, oh, you know, in hindsight, in the post-mortem analysis, we can see all of these things. That's not the life that parents are living, right? That's not your day-to-day -day with your child. I see the same thing with Nancy Lanza. People say, well, how on earth could she have gone out and shot guns with him? But Nancy's son hadn't shown violent behavior. And so how are you supposed to guess, right? Like, you're not supposed to guess that your child is going to do something unspeakably violent. That's not what being a parent is. I was constantly aware that people were judging me. And I was afraid. I was afraid of facing the media. I was afraid of being attacked. I was afraid. I was afraid every day for years. I stopped counting at 3,600 letters. And letters were coming to me from all over the world and have come to me from all over the world. I gave permission to anybody and everybody who knew me to protect me. Please, if you don't mind you know, opening these letters, I don't mind. Please take out anything that is hateful because I can't bear to hear it anymore. And I won't even talk about what they said or what they sent, but they were so hurtful but I kept them for many years. And when the time came to destroy them, I shredded them all. I think the worst day I had post-Columbine was the day that I finally got to see the Columbine police report. 
I had progressed in my grief up to a point at six months where I was trying to manage just putting one foot in front of the other, try to get through each day, try to breathe, try to eat, try to sleep. And I had some kind of a construct for what had really happened. Dylan was coerced into this. He was tricked. You know, he was brainwashed. All these things. I had all these questions about that. And I remember uh, one of the investigators just saying, hold your questions. Let us do our presentation. That was the day where I saw the basement tapes and learned what really happened. That was the day when I had to face the fact that Dylan was not there accidentally. And when I saw Dylan on tape, I had to really face the decadence, the destruction, the hatred. It was so horrible to think of my son, to envision him really doing those things and saying those things. And an explosion had gone off, and I'd been blown back into the past to have to re-grieve, reinvent my son, my relationship, myself, it was just horrible. And I was angry at Dylan after I saw those tapes. I was angry. I thought, you little so-and-so, to, after the life you've had and the love that you had, to be so ungrateful and so cruel so hateful and so racist and all these things, I was angry. But, but it was after that that I saw his writings. I knew I was going to be talking to Sue Klebold. The call was arranged through a, a third party. And it was a very difficult question to answer because her first question to me was, what happened to Dylan? And I was very aware that here I was, someone who had never met Dylan, talking to the woman who gave birth to him and raised him and saw him every day. And she was asking me to explain her own son. And when I talked to Sue, I talked about Dylan seeming to lose touch with reality. And I also phrased it in terms of, you know, when he did what he did, he was not really in his right mind. He was not the Dylan that she had known and raised. In Dylan's journal, he wrote about having like the worst existence in history, like suffering more than anyone has ever suffered. And he wrote about death as being some sort of a freeing experience, like he would break free and that would be a good thing to escape this earthly existence. So in this passage, you see some of Dylan's um, anguish and sense of being isolated from others. He writes, everyone, underlined, knows everyone. I swear, um, like I'm an outcast and everyone is conspiring against me. So he's not only feeling like an outcast, but there's a paranoid flavor to what he says. It was not always easy to make sense of. Up here, he originally wrote Dylan Klebold. Then he crossed it out, wrote, fuck that, and wrote me underneath where he had written Dylan Klebold. So it's one of those places where it's as if he's saying he's not Dylan, that Dylan is somebody else. He's me, but he's not Dylan Klebold anymore. I went through this journal for months. You know, there's an intersection between suicide and homicide. Now, most people who are suicidal are not homicidal, but a fairly high percentage of those who are homicidal are also suicidal. People who are willing to kill others are often willing and desire to die themselves. And when I saw his writings and I saw his longing his talking about his agony and his pain, that's when things started to feel more like a suicide picture than just a murderer. I came to the conclusion in my own mind that Dylan's wish to die was 
very much why he was taking part in this shooting in the first place. I'm sure there are some who would disagree with that and who would just say Dylan was evil. But I, having known Dylan all of his life from the time he was a little lad, you know, I believe that something was operating that impaired his ability to access those tools that he had of you know, empathy and judgment and hope and all the things that, that we would rely on to get us out of a suicidal crisis. But he ended up there. I don't know how to fix it. I know that as a reporter, I've now been covering these things for 20 some odd years. And there's a certain kind of grief that comes with covering it for 20 some odd years. It had gotten to the point for a while where it was like, oh, oh yeah, another one. Parkland's shook us out of that. go to one of two things. We go to guns, we go to mental illness. We need to understand that you need to go to both. That it might be one or the other in some cases, but I imagine we all agree that in order to take a gun and shoot up a school, you have to have something that's, that's gone wrong in your wiring. Whatever lessons we should have learned from Columbine, I would say, unfortunately, we did not. And that's why we keep repeating this very uniquely American tragedy. I am so opposed to violence. I can't stand violent movies. We never had guns in our home. I, I thought, you know, what else could I have done? I began to have a real desire to do something about murder-suicide, to try to educate people, to try to speak, to try to share what I'd learned. Four hundred and thirty-seven children died in 2013 from childhood leukemia. That's tragic. We wouldn't want a single child to die. And yet in that same year, 2013, 4,600 children died by suicide. Well, if we're looking at the National Institute of Mental Health for prevalence, their statistics, we're really talking about one in five children who will have a severe and debilitating mental disorder before the age of 18. So if that's one in five kids. I always tell this to parents. I say, even if it's not your child, it's definitely five children in your kid's class. So this is an issue for you. This is an issue for all of us. And we're seeing those numbers actually kind of scarily rise. Numbers showing that one in 10 of us is on an antidepressant. Girls are depressed ever earlier, are actively attempting suicide at much higher rates than a decade ago. The CDC put out an alarming report today on suicide. Nearly 45,000 
thousand Americans took their lives in 20. My situation is really different from Sue Klebold's. I have to make that really clear. I had had a child who I knew had a very serious brain issue from like very, very young. December 14th, 2012 was a day that changed my life. 911, what's the location of the emergency? Sandy Hook School. I think there's somebody shooting in here. Sandy Hook School. And my first thought was, what if that's my son Sunday? So I wrote that truth. I sent it out into the internet. I thought I was the only mother in America who felt that way, who wondered, what if that's my son Sunday? Even while it was anonymous, it started circulating virally and people were saying, wow, I'm Adam Lanza's mother too. I'm his father, I'm his sister, I'm his brother, I'm his school bus driver, I'm his psychiatrist, trying to get this child help, no services. I was overwhelmed by the response. For a blog posting by a mother in Boise, Idaho, went viral. But what she wrote about her experience on her blog reverberated around the country. Was seen by millions around the world. I wish that I could say things are improving since Newtown. I know after Newtown, when we talked about the state of mental health care, we thought, finally, people are going to pay attention. Finally, we may have a chance to improve things for children and families because of the magnitude of that tragedy. Uh, so we had hope. We had this great hope. And now it's been so many years after Newtown, and we're seeing the same exact stories in the news. Nicholas Cruz confessed to police that he was the gunman who shot up Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School here, killing 17 people. And now questions are swirling about whether warning signs were missed. Numerous, well-documented chances for the system to intervene in that young man's life. What looks like a pretty clear-cut case of some serious emotional and behavioral disturbance, right, that everyone knew about. The system fails. Even children who are identified, who have privilege, who have access, the system still fails our kids. And this is the state of mental health care in America today. It's uh, failing all of us. It's failing our communities, our children, our families. I come at this from is having spent 13 years as the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, which is the federal agency for research on mental illness. And the whole mission of that agency is to improve diagnosis and therapeutics and to reduce the burden of mental illness. I would say that in the 13 years I was there, I spent about $20 billion of taxpayer money to try to deliver on that mission. And I think we failed. We spend more than $3 trillion a year on healthcare in this country. 17% of our GDP is spent on healthcare. And we have about 95% of that money is spent treating problems. There's very little spent on prevention. And most of the problems that we're treating could have been prevented. And when it comes to prevention, there's a lot more we can do. All over the country for years now, schools have had things in place like lockdown drills, active shooter drills, how to survive an active shooter, run, hide, fight training, and all of those things. And all of those things might save lives, but none of them are prevention. All of them are the things you do after there's an armed intruder in the building. The reduction in heart attacks and heart disease, we didn't do that by just training more doctors in, in more efficient heart surgery methods or getting more people trained in CPR. We reduce heart disease and heart attacks by focusing on health, by focusing on jump rope for heart and healthy diets and you know eat less burgers and get outside. We focused on health, but we need to do the same thing in mental health. And I think a lot of times when we talk about that and we say, yeah, we need to get upstream, people will move upstream from here to here, but they're still just talking about risk factors and warning signs. And it's not that we shouldn't talk about risk factors and warning signs, but we have to have a bigger vision. One of the ways to think about this is if every seventh grader learned mindfulness and some aspects of uh, reframing and cognitive behavior therapy for managing mood, in the same way that they learned soccer and football and basketball, I mean, is that something that we should just build into a fitness campaign. Now, there is an attempt to do this in Australia. 
They're planning to do this literally with seventh graders at population scale. If you do this for 100,000 seventh graders, what's the long-term impact? All children need to be educated about good mental health practices and how to maintain them throughout life. But this requires a willingness to embrace great social change. I think there's a greater tolerance for this and a greater understanding of the importance of this in some other countries. It's been difficult for us in this country to understand the importance of mental fitness. We're very focused on physical fitness still. But in America today, many normally healthy children cannot pass a simple fitness test. Get into a good all-round sports program. Huh? Speaking of the president and first lady, Beyonce is now helping out with their Let's Move campaign that battles childhood obesity. A showdown on stage four, and that's how you become an American ninja warrior. Just this is just a piece of our health that is kind of an unexplored territory. We have not really begun to uh, dig into what it means to be mentally fit, and I think that's what we're really talking about here. So I was on a local board with Dave Slater um, a number of years ago, and uh, he works at the Dawson School now. We've been given permission to visit because they are incorporating a mindfulness program into their educational classroom. And they even go down to the very young grades. And I'm curious to see how that's handled at the kindergarten level. We do mindfulness K through 12. And, you know, we get kids as soon as we can. But there are huge benefits to doing it, starting it from a young age. I think it's hard for a lot of people to recognize the need to attend to mental health until there's a crisis. I mean, that was my experience. Until, you know, I landed in the hospital, and I think I really accepted that there was a problem. But we do this with everything else. We take our car to the shop for an oil change before the engine blows up, right? We rake the leaves in the fall so that, you know, we don't muck up our flowers or whatever. Preventative maintenance is an obvious part of every other part of our lives, so it should be part of our mental health. Hi, Sue Welcome to Dawson. Thank you. When you go up, you breathe in. When you go down, you breathe out. Sometimes it's nice to take a deep breath and be like, okay, I feel a little nervous right now, but if I take some deep breaths, it helps me slow down my thinking. Does anyone else want to add to that? Peyton. So Miss Smith said one time when you're having a monkey mind, you can let the balloon flow out of your head. And what would the balloons help you? They help you get rid of some of the thoughts you don't need anymore. Yeah. It's like when you're having tons of thoughts in your mind. Have you guys had tons of thoughts in your minds before? Yeah. I, yeah. I would Somebody says, well, come on, I just get it. You just get it? Before I helped my friend Lena do the pledge this morning, before I keyed the mic, she knows to... And then she looks at me and gives me a little head nod, and she's a fourth grader who's been with us since first grade.
Mental illness, things like schizophrenia, bipolar, anxiety, are not directly correlated to violence. Whether or not somebody has mental wellness is. Our public health system and our schools are investing in physical health with things like recess and, you know, good healthy school lunches. But, you know, how many schools have mental wellness programs? How many schools do things like mindfulness? Mindfulness is like the equivalent of eating a healthy breakfast. Yet when we talk about making schools mentally healthier and mentally well places for students to be, there's still opposition to that. And I think we need to, sort of as a society, get over it. I don't think we realize how critical mental health is to the foundation of children's brains. This is like over the top, off the scales important. So there's a Nobel laureate economist named James Heckman. And Heckman has created something called the Heckman Equation. And essentially it's that if we invest a dollar in early intervention, in early childhood, in public health that supports young children, we've saved $13 in both the public and healthcare system later on. In a two-year-old, in a six-month-old, in a one-year-old, you've got like a million neurons a second developing. All of these like millions of neural connections happening. That's not happening later on in life. That's not happening in my brain right now. Early investment needs to match up with this early brain development that's happening. And we know that social emotional learning when it's taught in kindergarten has an impact on future employment, has an impact on involvement in the juvenile justice system, involvement in the criminal justice system, in future relationships, in rates of divorce. I mean, there are so many things that studies have now shown can go back to mental wellness in kindergarten. I tried everything I knew to help my children grow up so that they could care for themselves. You know, we learned hygiene and we, we learned sexually transmitted diseases and speeding and drinking and driving and snake bite where, where I lived. I mean, it was everything I could think of to keep them safe. But I didn't think for a moment that the number two killer of youth was suicide. That was not on my radar screen. I never talked about that with my, with Dylan or with my kids. It wasn't something I thought about. It wasn't something I knew how to ask about or I knew how to dialogue about. And it just was not there, yet it was probably the greatest threat that they had. I remember certainly going to health fairs and I'd see a table, and they might have suicide prevention materials on there, I would walk right past it because I'd say, this doesn't apply to me. No one I love would ever die by suicide because I love them too much, and I wouldn't let that happen. I see now that many other people do that too. They look at my story and they say, well, my son would never do that. My child would never do something like this and they kind of dismiss anything I might have to say because they think it doesn't apply to them. But unfortunately, one of the lessons I've learned was that the rare, uh, certainly the rare event of murder side and the far less rare, rare event of suicide, it did, did apply to me, but I didn't have any way of, I didn't know that. And so I try to make people aware that it could happen to you.
I met Sue in 2012 as a call went out for people who are interested in forming an American Foundation for Suicide Prevention Colorado chapter. And Sue was one of probably like 30 people that showed up. Once we all kind of started stepping back from the board, kind of doing a little bit of self-care, we said, we just want to be with these people. They know kind of how we feel. Seven years ago, April 2nd, 2010, my 19-year-old son took his life. He said he was going to go down to the basement and just, you know, hang out, watch television. Next thing, we hear a loud bang, and he was gone. I was totally taken by surprise. You don't know everything that your children are doing. You just don't. This could be you. This could be you. You could be living my life. To the ones that say it will not ever happen you're you're blind you need to realize that it could happen to you i thought it couldn't happen to me and it did here i will open mine for christopher you're gonna love it. i'm gonna love it <laughs> okay. you're gonna love it you don't have to. Wow. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Thank you. The box for Oh, Christopher, you're right. I do love it. Souvenirs, coin book. What's a coin book? I love my children. I love them still. I think about them every day. I feel that if I had known more about mental health, I could have gotten them the help that they needed. If loving fiercely was all it took to keep mental illness at bay, then I know an awful lot of people who would be completely immune and protected. Just caring enough about your kids does not protect them from bad things happening. Just caring about your kids doesn't keep them from going astray. Just caring about your kids is important to parenting, but it's not enough to guarantee a happy ending for everybody all the time. Can I have a Christmas kiss? Mm. Mwah. Mwah. In the very last weeks of his life, I grabbed him and you know held his face in between my hands and I said, I love you so much and dad and I are so proud of you. He made a joke out of it and he went, oh, thank you. And then I said, no, I really mean it. I love you and dad and I are proud of you. And he, then he kind of said, you know, kind of an aw shucks, like thanks. Sir. I don't know how I could have shown him any more than I did that I loved him. It's good to know that someone loves you, but it's not something that controls your behavior. Knowing that you're loved isn't enough. It takes knowing how to care, knowing the right words to say, knowing how to connect them to resources. I didn't have that awareness that he was so deeply troubled, and I didn't have the tools to use to try to help him, had I known. And he just had such a unique vision on things. We didn't know. We didn't know how bad it was. Adam called me when he was on his lunch break and he was at my house. And I said, we need to figure this out. I said, we'll talk about it when I get home. And he said, okay. And I said, I, I love you. And he goes, I love you too, mom. And that's, I was the last. That's the last time I heard from him. <laughs> it was the worst thing in my life. <sighs> Adam 
He was a, a, a huge gift to me. If we had had what Dawson School has for you know our sons at that age, oh. would the outcome be different? Mm. Would they still be here? That is your last time, friends. Okay. Hand that heart center. Hand, Hand that, that heart, heart center. center. Reach for the sky. Reach for the sky. Reach for your toes. Reach for your toes. Reach for your toes. What I'm worried about in our society is the increase in suicide and that it is an option and it's an option for so many people and that it's not being addressed quickly enough or broadly enough. I, I think we're to the point where we could show you evidence of the effectiveness of preventive interventions for virtually every psychological and behavioral problem. We can prove that prevention works. We have tons of evidence on it. Name a problem. Depression, uh, we can prevent aggressive social behavior. We can prevent anxiety. We can prevent lots of problems. Because if you look at the data on effective preventive interventions, they don't prevent just one problem. That it's not that we just have here's the risk factors for suicide, and then here's the risk factors for substance abuse, and over here are the risk factors for truancy, and over here is violence, and over here is that these things, they have shared risk factors and they, they also have shared protective factors. So if we do our job well, and we do upstream strength-based prevention well, we're going to have an impact on suicide, but we're also going to see an impact on substance abuse and on truancy and on violence and on grade point average. It's a lot easier to focus on your science when you're not constantly in crisis. That really at its core, at its heart, it's a wellness model. That what we're after is we're, we're not just trying to keep people alive but we're trying to really help people live healthy lives and really help people and communities thrive. If you fall off the rails at 11 or 15 and you don't get the learning support you need or you don't get the behavioral support or emotional support you need, you may end up not reaching anything near your potential. And you're unlikely to be a school shooter or anything else, but you're very likely to be depressed or to feel terribly anxious or to not lead a happy life. And that's something we can avoid I think almost all the time. No one, including myself, could possibly have believed that we would have changed cigarette smoking as much as we have. And I'm a court certified expert on the marketing practices of the tobacco industry. Coffee, doctor? Oh, fine. Have a camel with your coffee. Thanks. Yes, folks, the pleasing mildness of a camel is just as enjoyable to a doctor as it is to you or me. They spend hundreds of millions of dollars to keep people believing, billions of dollars to keep people believing that smoking was the coolest thing. And yet we changed that, and we changed it with a lot less than the billions they spent marketing it. It's possible to change society. We can have historically lower levels of all of the psychological, behavioral, and health problems that we've been struggling with for thousands of years. It really can happen. If we can all band together to work toward these things, we can have a massively different society. We can teach kids at three or four years of age how to be uh, calm breathers and how to slow down. We can teach kids to start using emotional words at a very early age. That's when anything is possible. How do you feel right now, friends? Good. You feel good? Can you describe in words how you feel right now? Hey, how do you feel right now? I feel calm. You feel calm? Tell me, how do you feel? I feel calm and relaxed. You feel calm and relaxed? You can see, how do you feel? I feel really good. You feel really good? You look like you feel really good. Oh, my Angel, how do you feel? What? Have any of you practiced the mindful breathing at home? Yes. At home? I practice it on Sunday. On Sunday? Was there something that crossed your mind that made you want to think about relaxing? I, I was thinking about Christmas. You're thinking about Christmas? Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else practice mindfulness at home? Tegan, see. Um, 
I did mindfulness with my mom. You did mindfulness with your mom? What kind of mindfulness did you do with your mom? Um, You know, if we're going to fix this problem, it's going to be the, the love, caring, support, and the long-term commitment from people who care about you most, which tends to be your family. Hey, I'll see you later. Kids younger and younger and younger need to be introduced to mental health skills and resilience and social-emotional training, and parents need to know how to do that. There would have been many ways, probably, to stop a tragedy such as Columbine from happening, but my piece of this was the family system, the mother-child relationship. You know, when I see sunsets now, I still kind of have flashbacks to the summer after Dylan died. He died in April. And that summer was the summer I began taking walks with my friend in the evening. And we would walk. And I would try to get farther and farther because I was so weak I couldn't walk. But we would walk until sunset in, in the evening. I was extremely weak. I was actually sort of depressed, so it, it was very hard to move. I remember times when I would just sit on a bed and couldn't lift my foot to get a sock on, and then I would get one sock on. There were times where I really didn't know if I would live through it. It was enlightening to try to understand that when our minds are in control, felt, it felt impossible to try to deal with it. experiences cemented for me understanding the hell of what it is like to live with a malfunctioning brain. It was hell, that's all I can say. There's no other way to describe it. And to some degree, that helped me understand what Dylan might have gone through. I think he had an awful lot going on inside that he was really struggling with, and he was hurting, and he was confused and I wish I had known that suffering inner child that was there. I did ask him, are you okay? I remember asking him, you seem so tired, you seem so distant, are you okay? And he said, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. And he'd get up and he'd say, I have a lot of homework to do. And I remember having those conversations, but it wasn't enough, it wasn't enough. When I speak to Dylan in my mind, in my heart, 
the most frequent thing I say to him is, I'm sorry. I am sorry. I didn't understand this. I didn't get it. I didn't know how to help you. I'm sorry you had to go through this alone without any help because I didn't have the knowledge or the skills to help you. In the year before Dylan died, um, on Mother's Day, this was at the, a period of time when he was having all those troubles. That was when he got arrested and he had the trouble at school. And my husband had had surgery and Dylan forgot to feed the cat when he was home alone. And he, and he slept one day and missed school. And these things were piling up. And as a mother, I finally lost it on Mother's Day when he forgot Mother's Day. And he didn't even get me a card or a flower or anything. And I remember getting angry at him. And I pushed him against the refrigerator, really pushed him. And I was lecturing him. And I, you know, I went through, you are so selfish. You're only thinking of yourself. Why aren't you thinking of your family? We need you to help us. And just going on and on. And if I have any regrets of any moments I had with Dylan, it was that moment when I was pushing and lecturing and my wish is at that moment that I had shut up and just hugged him and pulled him close to me and said, sit down with me. What is happening? Tell me what's going on. And that's the thing I regret so terribly. It's been over 18 years, almost 19 years. There is still a, a large piece of me that will never forgive myself for not doing those things. But my way of dealing with that lack of forgiveness is to try to teach others and to share with others, this is what I wish I had done differently. I'm always gonna feel some sense of responsibility. I can't help that. I see things changing and I believe that things are getting better and we're getting more and more aware of how to make a difference. But every time we get a step further in that direction, there's always a, a great sorrow that I couldn't make that available for my son. I think often of watching Dylan do origami. I love to make a cup of tea and sit quietly beside him, watching his hands moving as quickly as hummingbirds, delighted to see Dylan turn a square of paper into a frog or a bear or a lobster. I'd always marvel at how something as straightforward as a piece of paper can be completely transformed with only a few creases to become suddenly replete with new significance. Then I'd marvel at the finished form, the complex folds hidden and unknowable to me. In many ways, that experience mirrored the one I would have after Columbine. I would have to turn what I thought I knew about myself, my son, and my family inside out and around, watching as a boy became a monster and then a boy again. Origami is not magic. Even the most complex pattern is knowable, something that can be mapped and understood. So it is too with brain illness and violence. And this mapping is the work we must now do. Depression and other types of brain disorders do not strip someone of a moral compass. And yet these are potentially life-threatening diseases that can impair judgment and distort a person's sense of reality. We must turn our attention to researching and raising awareness about these diseases and to dispelling the myths that prevent us from helping those who need it most. We must do so, not only for the sake of the afflicted, but also for the innocents who will continue to register as their casualties if we do not. One thing is certain, when we can do a better job of helping people before their lives are in crisis, the world will become safer for all of us.